I V M. Space, or at least Earth orbits, are no longer places where one needs to go boldly where no one has gone before. Once the exclusive domain of large national space programs, today there is a scope for a vibrant private sector in space beyond private companies as subcontractors and vendors for ISRO or NASA or the ESA. So, how do we enable a vibrant space sector in India? What are these recent announcements about an in-space agency being created in the country? Ranjana Kaul and Narayan Prasad join us to help us understand it all. Dear listeners, last week on episode 143, we started experimenting with podcasts that go beyond the audio and the conversation and contain interactive polls, links, illustrative images and more. We will continue to do the same in this episode as well. I would request all of you to try and listen to our episode today on the IVM Podcast Android app, the Adori iOS app, or your desktop or mobile browser to get a richer experience. You can download the IVM Podcast app at ivm.today slash android, the Adori iOS app at tinyurl.com slash adori app, or listen in on your browser from tinyurl.com slash pragati144. You can find these links in the episode description as well. In case you cannot do this right now, that's perfectly all right. You can listen to this and all future episodes on your current podcast app and you will have the same experience as always. You can switch when you can for a richer interactive experience. Welcome to the Pragati Podcast, a weekly talk show on public policy, economics and international relations. We take a step back from noisy political debates and dive into rich conversations on India and the world. I am your host, Pavan Srinath. We'll start this episode's conversation after a short break. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another awesome week on the IBM Podcast Network. If you're not following us on social media, please do. We're IBM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We'd like to thank our sponsors this week, Paytm Money and Intel. Their support makes this content possible. So, been a really exciting week on the network this week. We've had some really cool stuff. My old friend Vivek Lad was on Storytellers and Storytellers. Definitely do check that out. On Cyrus said we had Ashwin Sanghi on Thursday's episode. And Cyrus and myself did a cock and bull just the two of us. That was fun as well on Monday. Do check that out. Masaba was on Advertising is Dead, which was another really, really strong episode from Varun. And on the sports front, both Edges and Sledges, Football Shootball had some really fun episodes. That's the Football Twaddle. Do check those out as well. And if you haven't been paying attention and you haven't been listening to Smile India in these times, I don't know why you aren't. It's the most uplifting show that you could listen to. It's a short, bite-sized piece of really positive things that happen in India. Do definitely check that out. And with that, let's get you back to your show. Hi, I'm Pavan and welcome to episode 144 of the Pragati Podcast. On June 24th, the Cabinet of the Government of India met to approve the setting up of InSpace the Indian National Space Promotion and Authorization Center. And this has been heralded by some as historic space reforms in India. I'm joined today by Ranjana Kaul and Narayan Prasad, who will help me understand the need for space reform in India and what we need to know about recent in-space reforms, what we don't yet know, and what further reforms may be necessary in our country. Dr. Ranjana Kaul is a partner at Dua Associates, a leading law firm in India. She specializes in the international law of outer space and related national policies and regulations applicable to the space sector. Ranjana, welcome to Pragati. Thank you, Pavan. Also joining us is Narayan Prasad, who returns to the Pragati podcast. Narayan is the co-founder of satsearch.co, which is a global marketplace for space. Narayan is now Dr. Narayan Prasad with a PhD in supply chain management from Germany, And he was here last year on episode 93 to talk about markets in space. Narayan, welcome back and congrats on the PhD. Thank you very much, Pavan. Always a pleasure speaking with you. So, Ranjana, I want to ask my first question to you. ISRO is easily, by any metric, one of the best government institutions that we have uh, in our country. And Mm -hmm. India has one of the best national space programs in the world, and it's uh, quite competitive. Given that this is broadly true, What is the case for reform or radical reform of the space sector in India? So, Pavan, we need to understand what it is that the objective here is. 
Now, almost 60 years after the space program was started and is delivering, as you said, one of the best, the atomic energy is the other one, best outputs to the country consistently. What is it that the objective is as on date? And the objective is this, that today private sector companies and especially the new ones, there are so many others who have set up new companies and are exploring technology and disruptive, cheap, reliable access to in and from space. They are the ones in India who want a larger canvas to operate. That is to say, going beyond the demand supply mechanism by which the Department of Space procures its goods and services for its specific missions. It's nobody's case that you dismantle the way the Department of Space, ISRO, Space Commission, and all the other entities under the jurisdiction of Department of Space function, not at all. It cannot be because it is not a case that you're dismantling or hoping to dismantle the structure of the national space program. What you want is a parallel stream that allows the full potential of private sector to be enabled because what we need is an institutional structure under which a market-oriented and expansion-oriented mechanism can be put together to enable private space such that India can have a private uh, space industry, a private space se sector, which acts as an adjunct to lend strength to India's national space program. That is what reform means. And this is the first meaningful thing that has come from cabinet, of course, we have no idea at the present point in time whether it will be implemented in letter and spirit as we go along. Thank you, Ranjana. Narayan, as a, a private space entrepreneur himself, I mean, you've had a startup in India before, you have one that's based out of Germany now. Can you tell me what you think of as the role that the private sector can play in space that perhaps government agencies either cannot do or can need complementing? The role for the private sector is, I think, uh, quite clear. Earlier, the space program was organized in a way where government was providing government to government services. So it could be, for example, the Department of Space in this case, providing the Department of Agriculture or Ministry of Agriculture. What is the overall crop yield and crop acreage uh, for the country? It's a statistic that, you know, the government may be interested in food security. But if you think about it today, several companies that are supplying to the market may be interested to know what would be a price metric for every crop that is grown in the country. What I'm trying to say here is that um, there are opportunities today where the market needs either insight or communications, which are non-governmental, right? In this case, it could be um, Reliance uh, Fresh or uh, one of these uh, Tata supermarket chains that wants to know what would be the total yield so that they can make uh, purchase decisions uh, on you know which crop will uh, which they want to buy at what prices. And today, satellite can provide these kind of intelligent inputs to them to make those uh, business decisions. It could also be somebody who is providing uh, you know an aquaculture service and they want to know. Uh, what is happening with their uh, feed, you know, the thing that they're growing. And for example, the U.S. Uh, food supply chain today wants you to keep track of uh, everything from how it goes from farm to fork, right? And so satellite can be a sensor where there are no networks for somebody to keep track of what is happening in their aquaculture farm. And then to prove that, you know, they have uh, a trail of record of the health of the uh, produce that they are doing. So these are opportunities where you have to look at uh, what these businesses would need to be productive and uh, what would give them intelligence to create uh, some decisions, as well as what would make them ultimately competitive in the, in the market. Two broad questions to both of you, short ones. One, are we seeing like a 1991 type moment here, even if it's not condensed in one year, where in 91, we liberalized a lot of industries, we got rid of a lot of license Raj and so on. 
and we created institutional systems whereby private sector could operate more freely in the country. Is that not true in India? And therefore, we need these reforms. Where before this, between the government and ISRO, most of what was needed was being done. Yes, it could very well be a 1991 moment for private space participation. Uh, excepting the difference here is that there is already a critical mass, as far as private sector is concerned, who are perfectly capable of, you know, rolling out full participation and reaching those objectives in a couple of years. The 1991 itself opened to foreign direct investment. And those opportunities led to the boom that, uh, you know, you and I are all enjoying now. So, well, yes, it could very well be. But those reforms were pushed and implemented by government at all levels with a tremendous focus. Now that the cabinet has approved in space, if it continues its focus to ensure that that institution is enabled with the required regulations in place, to allow for private sector participation, that would be brilliant. Thank you. And the related question for me was, uh, and Narayan, we've talked about this in our last episode as well, on episode 93, where, you know, at one point in time, space was this place. And when we talk space, lower orbit is just, what, a few hundred kilometers of ours, right? Space was this place, to paraphrase Star Trek, to go boldly where no one has gone before the low Earth orbit and where most satellites operate around the Earth, this is no longer a place where no one has gone before, right? It is something that is now well within the reach of the private sector and not just big national programs. Yeah, I think the easiest analogy for anybody out there is the internet, I think. Uh, because if you look at the internet, it was a military program. And uh, the current TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter generation would have not existed if internet was purely a government and a military program. And we all know how internet uh, got really, really big and became this uh, place for doing commerce, place for doing a lot of things today, social media and so many other things happening on the internet. That is because essentially private sector was allowed to use internet as a medium to conduct you know, business or to conduct trade or to conduct uh, you know, operations, right? So. The similar thing is happening to space today, where essentially earlier, somebody who used to create infrastructure in space, either as rockets being produced or satellites being produced, is now you know shifting towards the private sector to have the private sector produce both rockets and satellites and also provide the services uh, at the same time. So the journey that the internet took uh, let's say 40 or 50 years uh, through the time is something that uh, you know space is now doing before we go further ranjana can i ask you could you perhaps even summarize what the current reform announcements are and sort of how much we know right now so what do we know as yet we don't we only know that the finance minister had uh, on the 16th of May recognized that there was need for a transparent regulatory mechanism and environment uh, and policy for the private sector space companies. And if this was followed by the announcement of this institutional structure that is called in space under the jurisdiction of Department of Space. And I'm absolutely convinced that if the Department of Space should be minded and focused to put it together and make it happen successfully, they can do it. They have done it with the National Space Program. You may know about the very serious challenges that India faced after the first nuclear uh, test that we did and then the second nucleus test. And we stood our ground. IS, when we, did, we talk of ISRO because that's the one that everyone knows, but the entire unified command structure of Department of Space, Space Commission, ISRO, and every all other entity stood their ground and they have delivered. So if they wanted to, they can do this too. There's nothing at all regulatory wise impeding what is the aspiration of India of today. To be very honest with you, I'm still a little bit uh, very confused because um, what they call it is an autonomous uh, body which is parallel to 
ISRO and uh, New Space India Limited, but under the Department of Space. And if they call it an autonomous body, and if it is a regulator, now the question is if this is an autonomous body that can set rules or is it a real regulator? And that's a very important difference, I think, because if the chairman of ISRO is also the secretary of the Department of Space, then there is a, a conflict of interest there because uh, the regulator is then overseen by a person who is holding two different positions, uh, which is like, you know, having the bo your boss as you yourself. Or rather the umpire is also the one of the teams. Exactly. Right. Okay. So that I think is a, a very important uh, distinction and uh, that has not been made very clear as far as I can understand because uh, I don't know, maybe R Ranjana can add her opinion uh, and you know suggestions here. If news in space is a regulator, can it exist without a law you know, creating that as a regulator? Typically, uh, that is not how a regulator ought to function or should function. If you look at any other regulator that we have got, for example, let's take the Airport Economic Regulatory Authority of India or the TRAI, the Telecom Regulatory Authority. You can have an act of parliament that creates a regulator and you can have, but if that regulator is not autonomous in the true sense of the word uh, NP, which is that it is able to have an income to support itself, where it is however manned by government officers and paid for by the government there will always be that shadow on that regulator now as far as space is concerned i entirely agree you cannot have a licensor a regulator and a dispute redressal mechanism all in one entity which is also simultaneously clearly in conflict of interest as far as the, that entity is concerned the incumbent let's call it you know, the problem, I think, as I see it when I'm talking to you now, is that the Antarix Corporation and uh, now the new space, when they enabled satellite telecommunications in India, the obvious thing was that the Department of Space would provide the transponder capacity. And suddenly you found that in a few years, spectrum allocation slots in the orbit and the humongous potential of commercial revenue suddenly got attached to this entity, which was only delivering, as NP said, government requirements. That is what was happening with the space program. Now, while the SATCOM policy has, the cabinet had approved setting up a private satellite systems of uh, allowing private satellite operators to operate, uh, to launch from India, all of that, that part of SATCOM never got implemented, even as we speak. And there came about a huge amount of deficit in the capacity, transponder capacity, which needed to be present to service the commercial sectors. And so we, it was hired on foreign satellites. And the transponder capacity is designated as insight and then provided downstream. Now that today, because this part for allowing private satellite system was not implemented, there is now an entire revenue vertical, for example, which is derived out of the higher capacity when it is uh, leased out downstream. These are very important issues for the incumbent. If they want private sector to participate, they're going to have to seriously consider about do I want to just protect this that I have, my balance sheet, or does government want to say that, look, I mean, going forward, here is this private sector company, which is going to pay corporate tax, which is going to hire people at, you know, high income, they will pay income tax and net net the country GDP and the consolidated funds of India increase because of that potential. These are very, uh, what shall I say, they're existential questions. And that is why I said that the cabinet has approved, it approved in 2000, it's approved now. Will it be implemented actually? So Ranjana, what you're also saying is that what we are seeing with uh, especially television broadcast transponder capacity, that's actually one point of evidence to actually show that 
ISRO's current capacity and activity is not sufficient for the needs of India. I agree with you, Pawan. I want to take a few steps back over here because I think both me and I think many of our listeners may not be familiar with the intricacies of the organizational structure, focus, mandate of what ISRO is. Narayan, for example, you mentioned earlier that uh, the head of ISRO is also the secretary of the Department of Space. Now, this itself is very interesting because this is also a unique situation where uh, a, a technocrat is given a secretary position where in most other places the secretaries would come from perhaps the IAS pool, right? So, uh, space and uh, the space systems in the government have their own unique history. But can you break down what ISRO and the Department of Space is right now so that we can understand what in space is in context? I think you have to go back to history a little bit to understand this whole thing. Historically, I think, uh, you know, it's uh, kind of an infamous thing to say that uh, bureaucrats slow everything down in India, right? And I guess, you know, that is one of the reasons why the structure evolved where Vikram Sarabhai was given kind of control as uh, secretary of Department of Space and also held the chairman uh, position, which is quite unique uh, to any uh, organization in India. And I suppose, you know, that was the way that they tried to avoid this uh, red tapeism and bureaucratic hassle. And eventually what this then did is uh, that one person was made the head of three different uh, positions or four different positions historically. If you look at that, then it's the secretary of Department of Space uh, who sits uh, on overseeing three organizations, which is uh, the Space Commission, the Indian Space Research Organization, and Antrix Corporation, historically, was all the same person. And of course, then the Secretary of Department of Space was then the chairman of the Space Commission, which was the policy-making body of uh, the country for space, and uh, as well as then the chairman of ISRO, who has to execute you know, most of the mandate of the Space uh, Commission. And then, you know, most recently was also then the chairman of Antrix uh, until recently when the whole Antrix uh, Devas thing exploded only after that, you know, the the chairman of Antrix was not then the, it was split, the position was then split and an independent chairman and managing director was uh, appointed as a part of the reforms after the whole, uh, you know, uh, Devas and ISRO uh, thing, right? So now there's still three positions that, uh, the chairman of uh, ISRO holds, which are, you know, essentially these three uh, positions that uh, has to be technically three different people. But, you know, because at that point of time when the space program was quite small and uh, it didn't really have to have uh, uh, this oversight of the three different people, which would make it more complex, I would suppose that uh, then, you know, we haven't changed that organization structure in like 60 years. Maybe it did make sense at that point of time for the last 50 years, it made sense so that uh, one person would have control so that decision making would have been easier and things would have been uh, fast tracked in terms of decision making. But now it's a, it's a challenging thing for, for the future, especially if you throw in the private sector into this mix because uh, Institutions, you know, hold out for themselves. So if I am, if I have spent 40 years in a particular institution, I will defend it tooth and nail to the end because I've spent my lifetime working for that institution and I've spent my lifetime, uh, you know, working for some ideas that institution holds, right? So now it's very human in nature for somebody in ISRO, let's say a former ISRO chairman, who spent 40 or 45 years of his life working for that institution at various capacities to then defend that institution tooth and nail. So, you know, we can see that now. I get that, Narayan, and we will delve into that political economy a little more. But so right now you have the chairman of ISRO who wears three hats, right? And which can therefore lead to a potential conflict of interest. Can you also help me understand? So there is ISRO as an entity which does uh, research, it does technology development, it builds launch vehicles, it builds its own satellites. And ISRO also offers launch services for non-ISRO satellites. Is that where Antrix comes in? Is Antrix, is the job of Antrix to 
use ISRO's launch service capacity for non-ISRO satellite launches? Is that the mandate? That is, of course, one of the mandate. The whole idea of Antrix was to look at the exploitation of the you know, extended capacity of ISRO in the commercial market. So what you talked about is in the launch vehicle side. It could also be renting ground equipment uh, antennas, for example, to international players that ISRO has established. It could be selling imagery of ISRO satellites to international players. So essentially, anything that concerns Indian space capacity created by government through ISRO, which can be sold or if there's interest in the commercial market outside of India, is what Antrix is concerned about. The structure, the, the creation of a atomic energy program, uh, followed by the creation of space, is something that happened in the nascent years after we got independence. This is in the geopolitical background of already a Hiroshima and Nagasaki, already Hitler's V2. And the short point I'm trying to make is that it was self-evident that both atomic energy which UN had already said had approved would be for peaceful purpose already in 1963, and space, which represents the high ground, are both highly critical and, of course, because it can also be peaceful as much as it can be aggressive, it's a dual-use domain. And it is for this reason that when uh, Homi Bhabha, uh, you know, uh, and Jawaharlal Nehru, then the Prime Minister, they agreed that an atomic energy department would be uh, created and followed there from uh, Dr. Sarabhai came into the picture and then set up that department of space. Therefore, both these departments are functioning under the direct oversight of the Office of Prime Minister of India. And no matter which party is in power, it has always received the fullest backing of whoever is in part, whichever government party, whatever. Now, how do they function? Why are they allocated specific roles? How did it happen? It is, some, there's something called the allocation of business rules. That means allocation of business to ministries and departments of the union government. This is issued under constitutional provisions. And 1960 was the first time that this happened. Allocation of business rules were first issued in 1960 or 61, I think. Okay. In 1972, if I'm not mistaken, is when the Department of Space was actually established as a department. The ISRO had already taken birth and it was already conducting its uh, research and, uh, you know, launching and so on and so forth. And then there was a jurisdictional control under the Department of Space where the ISRO functions under. So in a sense, it's a, a derivative of the Department of Space, as with all other entities that function that we understand as space. We know ISRO because that's the one, you know, the one who's doing all the stellar stuff and impressing everybody around the world doing what they're doing. It's only after the SATCOM policy and this business of having to commercialize, that means to be able to commercialize that opportunity that Antarix came about and an appropriate amendment was brought to the allocation of business rules to allow for commercialization. And especially when Mrs. Gandhi first tested in Pokhran, which was an underground nuclear test, which was permitted and not in violation of any international agreement, then the world woke up to say that who, who are these people? And what does it mean? It's always like that. And then again, when uh, under Mr. Vajpayee, it's only now that we have been able to become members of all the multilateral organizations pertaining to nuclear supplies, excepting the nuclear supplies group, which is blocked by China. So there is a reason why it is extremely sensitive. It is an extremely sensitive task, atomic energy and space. It has to be nurtured in that way. But that is not to say that you cannot have a parallel where that same focus is brought to bear for private sector and industry. And whatever adjustments that government and Department of Space needs to do for that purpose, it is necessary to take a long-term view 
where is going to be India in context to space 50 years from now? What about 30 years? What is our immediate tactics? What about five years? This is cardinal for the country's national interest. Is it fair to say that ISRO developed its excellence and its sort of institutions in an environment where India was fairly closed off from the world at large when it came to a deep technology access? And that sort of culture has survived to a place, even though now ISRO is actively collaborating with other international uh, space programs this culture of sort of independent, indigenous and within institutional development has been something that has become a part of the ISRO DNA. And today that is potentially a barrier for allowing more free competition and the entry of private sector and so on to thrive alongside ISRO in the country. Is this a fair thing to say? Uh, Well, uh, yes and no. In the sense that after the Kargil War, 99. Yes. But around that time is when India for the first time clearly separated civil space, which is Department of Space, ISRO, that entire area, and military space. So ISRO deals only and only with civil space applications. And yes, it has over the years, because of, you know, back to the wall situation, developed its own. But also a lot of those technologies that it has developed on its own have been licensed and they keep getting these, uh, you know, buyer supplier. So that is one vertical. But there is also the new companies with new technologies that are now asking for, you know, a bit like Oliver, asking for more. Can you always wait for that one gate to open where there may be an opportunity to supply some particular goods or services. And is that all? That is the intention because the fact is that the many, many zillions of civilian applications downstream and the requirement for uh, outer space assets, can ISRO itself provide for all of this? I mean, in my opinion, clearly not. It is not doing it already. Do we therefore need space industry? Yes, we do. Can the two together make a difference to India's standing as a space part? Yes, it will. Long-term vision. That's what we want. Thank you, Ranjana. One final question before we take a quick break and then we can spend some more time on the private sector. You mentioned the SATCOM policy. Narayan talked about uh, sort of ISRO's structure and the multiple hats. Are there other policies right now uh, made by other departments that are potentially barriers for the space sector to do whatever it can. Like, for example, is there an overlap between sort of telecom regulations or policies and other things that also have a bearing on the space? Yeah, of course, you know, there is the problem is that um, space is a very multi-department, multi-ministry issue, right? Uh, Unlike many other, uh, you know, issues in the government or many other sectors, Space, uh, you know, affects obviously national security, uh, other issues as well. You cannot like leave that aside and say private companies can do whatever they want. Uh, no gov- no country in the world will allow that, right? Now, the question is, how do you solve it? The problem is that uh, there is no structure today that is available that allows different departments and different ministries of the government of India to come together to take a call on space-related issues. So the Secretary of Department of Space sits in Bangalore. The Secretary of Department of Telecommunications sits in Delhi. Now, if some company says, I want to have access to a particular frequency to operate my satellite, it may not be a communications uh, satellite, but even uh, just a imaging remote sensing satellite, they will need to have access to the frequencies in the commercial domain to operate that particular satellite. And now today in India, for example, we have no way to know how they will get access to that uh, frequency and you know what would be its cost, how would it be allocated, and so many other issues lie ahead. So for that to be solved, for example, the Department of Telecommunications and Department of Space need to come together to see how 
that allocation will happen, uh, you know, uh, who will give up the frequencies uh, for them and what would be the charge, how would it be the, the mechanism to make that available and so on, right? And this happens also on the imaging side. Let's say today I have a satellite that is imaging uh, India in less than one meter or so on. If I have to distribute that imagery, maybe, you know, the Ministry of Home says, I don't want this imagery to be distributed by or Department of, uh, you know, the Defense Department says, I don't want this to be distributed in a certain way or certain uh, areas or so on. So therefore, for private sector to also be efficient, these departments have to come together. And that is where I think government has a decent opportunity with in space where it can say that every member who represents a particular department or ministry that has some concerns in space can be a member in in space to voice their opinion and by default create a single window system to then uh, you know for the private sector to have a window to talk to because if i have to now get this problem of space frequency issue sorted for example i have to go to two different cities and talk to two different offices and try to convince them without having them to come work with me on a single window, right? So those are, I think, some of the things that people have to keep in mind as they, uh, you know, move these reforms. What NP is saying is quite true. As far as remote sensing data and geospatial information is concerned, that is also, uh, of course, a DOD thing for the army, it means one thing and for you and me, it means something different. But most importantly, it is critical for the defense services and security. The point to consider is that while in outer space, the organizing principle of law is that no sovereignty is recognized. No country owns outer space. You own airspace, but not outer space. So everybody's uh, satellites, which are remote sensing, are going around the orbit across. And they sense, they're allowed to send, no violation of law at all. Question is that when you have processed all that data about your country, to what extent and level do you want it to be made available within the territorial jurisdictions of India? Which is why most of a uh, lot of people that we know who are doing location based and such like services are procuring it from outside the country. Very, very sharp resolutions about India. So I, I couldn't agree with you more, Ranjana. Yeah, so you'll just have to, the government has to find a mechanism to, uh, to screen all this data and keep everything else open for the public to use. Yeah, I think recently, what is it? Um, news channels were using imagery for the conflict that's ongoing in Ladakh yes, from yes. Planet Labs and Maxar and other uh, foreign companies because yes. they have access to it and it informs our journalism. We can actually see that, for example, China is building certain new structures in places where there were none before and that were patrolled by Indian forces. And all of this information is anyway coming from abroad. Uh, yes. So and, and we are sort of hampering people within our country from being able to have um, competing or competitive products, which which can benefit us as well. Uh, yeah. So thank you so much, uh, Ranjana and Narayan. Let's take a quick break and I want to come back and I want to get a sense of what kind of private sector activity we've seen in space so far, maybe examples of startups and other companies and what they're doing. And uh, Nara and I hope to draw from your, some of your personal experiences as well. Namaste, I am Saurabh Chandra. And I am Pranay Kutistan. When we are finished, we will solve the problems of the world and the world of 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 the world. अब आजकल के अपार्टमेंट वालों ने तो कभी पुलिया देखी नहीं होगी पर आप फीलिंग तो समझ ही सकते हैं तो आइए शामिल हो जाइए हमारी पुलियाबाजी में जहां प्रणय और मैं एक से एक इंटरेस्टिंग टॉपिक्स की तह तक जाएंगे आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस बिटकॉइन पाकिस्तान मेडिकल एजुकेशन करेंसी क्राइसिस कभी हम दोनों के साथ और अक्सर स्पेशल एक्सपर्ट गेस्ट की कंपनी में सुनिए हमें आई की वेबसाइट ऐप या अपने फेवरेट पॉडकास्टिंग प्लेटफॉर्म आरोप हर दूसरे हफ्ते Welcome back to the Pragati Podcast. I'm Pavan Srinath and I'm here today with Ranjana Kaul and Narayan Prasad on, and we're talking about space reforms, the opportunity that in space might be providing us and how we can have a flourishing private sector space industry in the country. Narayan, you've had space related startups both in India and now abroad. Can you just give me a sense of 
what are the subsectors in space where uh, people can start companies what what kind of things can they do so space uh, is you know divided into upstream and downstream upstream is when you just simply build rocket satellites or uh, even sometimes uh, ground antennas uh, where you're providing more the infrastructure side of space and not the services uh, side of space and the downstream is when you're using satellite data or satellite positioning or satellite communications to kind of provide the service that's the the you know broad framework, right? On the upstream where you are either building a rocket or a satellite or so on, you have to have essentially government clearances for you to get access to a lot of infrastructure on the ground, testing infrastructure or even place to test uh, or even access to the frequencies. And those are today not uh, really available as a mechanism to the private industry. And but in spite the, of that, there are a few startups which are trying and hoping. Is that the current phase or is there, are there no startups in the satellite and the launch vehicle space in India right now? There are uh, at least three prominent you know, launch vehicle startups in India today that are uh, trying to get up and running and several other companies that are trying to build their own uh, satellite infrastructure. So this is a chicken and egg problem because you cannot hope to have laws for imaginary companies you know, where government cannot create like a laws for imaginary companies, I suppose. So now you have to have some activity going for the government to then respond. And now this activity has been brewing in the last few years. And I guess the creation of InSpace is a response by the government, but you'll have to see how that pans out uh, in terms of real implementation. Certainly. What about downstream space applications, Naran? Any broad buckets in which you see various companies operating? Yeah, one is, of course, clearly the use of satellite imagery and satellite data. And of course, you know, most of the companies, I would guess that more than 90% of the companies trying to, to provide downstream application services using satellite data use uh, non-ISRO satellites today because it's much easier to access the data from European and American satellites, which are free and open, a lot of them free and open, than uh, getting access to, let's say, an ISRO satellite data today. Uh, so those, okay. those companies uh, are using, you know, medium resolution, not very high resolution data because anything below like one meter has to go through government clearance. And they're using that data openly to then provide some services on top. You know, communications is much more trickier because uh, they need to have clearance from the government for certain uh, kind of service that, that you, can, uh, you can provide. Uh, by communication, what exactly do you mean, Narayan? I mean, like, is this... Uh, auxiliary to the internet? Are we talking about old school satellite phones? So there are, again, different forms of communication services. Uh, the typical example would be your direct to home, uh, you know, uh, transponders that, uh, you know, essentially government has to give you those uh, transponder ca capacity for you to provide that service. It could also be internets. Uh, I don't think so. There is uh, space based internet as of yet in India because we don't really have uh, capacity at the moment to provide that uh, as of now. And it could also be narrowband, for example, it could be something like Internet of Things, where you are providing very low data rate uh, communications. It could be satellite phones. So we also know that satellite phones are not allowed in India as well. As far as remote sensing data or any of that information is concerned, you know, it depends on the policy approach of a government. So either there is presumption of openness, which means that your security and defense establishment clearly identifies has the first call to take to say that okay now this is not going to be provided in public domain everything else can be open or you work on a policy or you have a policy based on prohibition everything is prohibited unless i say so so our approach is prohibition that is where the problem lies and in the face of a situation as np said and you were also talking about all kinds of imagery being available in your, you know, in your drawing room. You can look at your television and you know what China is building and what we are doing, etc. It's openly available. So they'll have to be, I mean, the maximum that happens is that these images are restricted. Government data is restricted for supply within the territory of India. But an Indian national outside the country going and tapping on his laptop can get that same thing without restriction. These are things that government or the departments need to sit out, sit and work out. Otherwise, even an in-space will not be able to do 
it will be paralyzed if there are too many people. These problems have to be sorted out first and foremost. And this silo and turf approach has to stop. So in that sense, Ranishna, one of the perhaps uh, meta or underlying challenges is that, say, 30 years ago or 40 years ago, these were things where the government not only had a monopoly, but could effectively exercise an inordinate amount of control, right? You could control who broadcasts television into India, you could control who has access to India's sort of satellite imagery, all of that. But since the internet and all of that, all these barriers gone away and you cannot control this anymore. So any restrictions that are put are purely artificial and actually hamper the domestic industry rather than be effective in any way, right? Like, for example, even if you ban all Indian startups from accessing the high resolution space imagery, you can get that from outside. And perhaps governments need to internalize the fact that these bans are ineffective and meaningless and these controls have to be completely rethought for the 21st century. Right. So along with that, Naran, a very quick question. So given that we are still in this nebulous space where there's very little regulatory clarity, do you have a rough sense of how many space-related startups and companies are there in India? And along with that, are there other companies which are sort of subcontractors of ISRO or they provide services directly to ISRO as a PSU? So there are about uh, 30 to 35 uh, space-related startups today in India that have been created in the last uh, 10 years or so. And uh, the ISRO supply chain, I think, has about 150 or 200 uh, prominent vendors, uh, SMEs and uh, larger companies. But the extended value chain of ISRO may be up to 500 companies. Okay. And, and sometimes I've seen in public conversations when people talk about the private sector, somebody from ISRO usually steps up and says, look, we have already uh, been working with 500 SMEs and others. And uh, why are you talking about private sector in space? But they're hiding the truth that these are subcontractors and vendors for ISRO and not necessarily players who have a lot of independence with what they do, right? Yeah, exactly. So one of the problems there is most of these uh, vendors that we work with, ISRO, essentially they don't have any intellectual property that they own that is independent. So for example, let's say ISRO is producing this rocket or the satellite. Most often, most of these companies that work with them, the people in ISRO who have developed that particular intellectual property would have gone to them, sat with them, told them how do you produce this, not design it. So, and they will tell them what equipment you need to produce them and you can invest in that equipment and you can produce it. And they will even tell them how do you make sure that the quality of it is good enough to be flown in space to this ISRO level of quality. So most of these vendors in the 200 companies or so, they have excellent facilities where excellent manpower who knows how to produce it excellent quality control to know that the quality is good enough, but less than 10% of them will know how do you design it? How do you, you know, uh, what is the workflow behind the idea of this particular product? And that is where the startups are trying to innovate for the first time, essentially because they don't have themselves, you know, locked into this uh, traditional vendor approach but essentially are trying to create their own products and their own intellectual property for the first time. Thanks, Narayan. And, and what you mentioned earlier, again, comes back to me, right? This chicken and egg problem with policy reform. And in policy, we also always think about this, this missing stakeholder, right? So there are laws and rules that have disabled certain stakeholders from existing in the first place. And because those voices are not there, you don't have champions for reform or people who, who you know, will benefit and therefore bad for certain reform. And, and I'm glad that we uh, there are people who are putting their money where uh, their ideas are and starting off even in a circumstance where the laws and the uh, rules, there is so little clarity and so many things that are perhaps explicitly or implicitly forbidden. Just a thought there. Um, this is not just uh, unique to India. That is what we have to understand, you know. And it's not unique if to you, space either, right? Absolutely. So if you go back and talk to some of the folks in uh, NASA and the U.S. private sector, they will tell you that uh, nobody imagined a company like SpaceX will carry astronauts for the U.S. government to the International Space Station 20 years ago. 
everybody would have been expected to be a vendor to to NASA saying they will you know design uh, or produce some part of the stuff within that system that NASA is producing and 20 year, and it's taken them 20 years to evolve that program where they said uh, look we see a role for the private sector to to play you know this role of even providing you know transportation services of resources and astronauts to the international space station and they have gone on to do studies saying that you know we, nasa has saved a few billion dollars by creating that competition in the private sector to provide that service and you know we we see that uh, in the us as well it's just that you know they have evolved and uh, they are they are ahead of time but that's in, that's essentially the same path that we are trying to take in india as well well uh, i'll only support what np is saying it is for us quite obviously to decide where we want to be, like I said, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now. And uh, that start has to be here and now. It's no use saying, oh, well, we are much better than everyone else. We can do things much cheaper. You're doing things much cheaper because you do not calculate your establishment cost. The government does not calculate its salaries and so on and so forth that go, let's say, oh, we are offering a cheap launch, but you're not calculating all the costs that a private sector company has to calculate. Therefore, you're cheaper. I couldn't agree with you more, Ranjana. In fact, one of the first things I actually ended up writing on space was doing a basic calculation on what the Mars Orbiter mission actually cost. And if you actually look at ISRO's own documents, they say that there were three particular um, ISRO centers that uh, spent a significant part of three years of their uh, time working on the Mars Orbiter mission, but that is not captured in the MOM budget line. And the mm. MOM budget line was 450 crores. And that was touted as this number where, you know, in $75 million, we've gotten to Mars and how we are the most uh, inexpensive and cost-effective space program in the world. Whereas, yeah, I mean, the land is free. The staff are um, comparatively underpaid compared to any professional space organizations elsewhere. And there are so many of these implicit costs and it's an accounting number, right? It's not the true economic cost of the Mars Orbiter mission program. But uh, Pavan, just to say, uh, you know, on the other side, is that when government is engaged in any kind of public good, services for the public, then it expends its uh, monies without considering rate of return because it is its obligation to provide essential whatever those services may be. Fully agree, because the benefit is accrued to society, right? Not to government revenue. Yes, exactly. But where now in the parallel, in the case, let's say, of space, you have got a vertical which enables you to commercialize those, like NP was just talking about, Antariksh, and uh, providing uh, transponder services for commercial uh, telecommunications and broadcasting. Then you have got a revenue stream coming there, you're considering your rate of return. If you're uh, renting a transponder for X, you're making it available downstream for X plus 0.1. So there are two things that are happening parallelly in our in our ecosystem here. Completely agree. And, and I think we have to reimagine what this means, right? Like to me, the example uh, in the weather uh, sector is, is what the U.S. National Weather Service does. The National Weather Service has its own set of satellites. It also has uh, scientists. It has organizations dedicated to weather predictions and so on. And they actually provide a floor and a base of open data, open access, open a lot of information on top of which, which is available for public consumption and for um, uh, private companies to consume. They might make some revenue in some specific provision of APIs, etc. But beyond that, they allow a private sector, including, you know, weather.com and other companies to build on that scaffold that the NWS provides. And therefore, uh, the United States as a whole can benefit where you have a larger government role in, in disaster management, prediction of uh, hurricane paths and so on and perhaps a greater private sector role in is it going to rain outside your doorstep an hour from now and that together makes for a more vibrant ecosystem right and therefore the economy and the society is benefited from there so here uh, i want to ask uh, both of you we have in space that is happening we have 
still a lack of clarity on what this might be, how independently it will be set up, whether it will be a regulator with teeth or not. And in India also, we've had examples like Rai, which is a regulator, but the Department of Telecom still actually does a lot of the regulation. And that remains a government department. In both of your uh, view, what are the big picture reforms that are necessary, the reform ideas that are necessary to have a truly flourishing private sector industry alongside ISRO over the next decade, two decades and and more? Exactly what I've been saying all the while is that if InSpace is to actually materialize into creating this whole wonderful vertical with the private sector, then they have to resolve these questions of whatever are the balance sheets and books and so on and so forth of Antariksh or New Space. What is it and how is it that they're going to enable open policies such that in the background, already work has been done by the various ministries to sit and resolve issues to make this happen. And finally, there is a question, look, there's all this is happening downstream and on ground, whether it's manufacturing of you know, data and, and analysis, so on and so forth. The other aspect is actually operating in space. Now that also the cabinet approved in 2000. So we need to have, we obviously, if it is a domain where international law and only international law applies, India has international obligations. We have ratified the four major treaties. We have to establish an Indian registry so that NP wants to launch a satellite, PSLV, you pay for that launch and it is launched from India and it's registered in the Indian registry with whatever designator and informed to the UN office in appropriate ways. You need to have a licensing system which involves specific obligations pertaining to, for example, environment, not introducing any extraterrestrial material or any substance on so forth. It is important to remember that international obligations are applicable as between nation states, the member countries. Downstream, non-government organizations are necessarily to be controlled by the government itself. So it will have to be the Department of Space that tells anybody to whom it issues a license to set up of precisely what it is can and cannot do in outer space in terms of activities. Unless we enable that and create a full ecosystem, upstream linked to downstream, it will still be truncated. I think uh, I'll add some things on the operational side of all of this. Uh, so one of the things that in space uh, is supposed to have, or people have said, is that they will have different directorates that will look at uh, technical, legal, and other uh, issues. So there are a few things that I think it will be very valuable to do. We don't have any think tank in the government today that is uh, mapping what is the contribution of India's space activity into its economy or its GDP or productivity of the country. And that's something that I think in space can do, where essentially a group of social scientists, uh, you know, economists and technical space scientists can come together to map the status of India's space economy and what is, you know, this one rupee invested in the Indian space program creating returns to the people. And that will also allow you know, an independent kind of a task force to take into account the needs of the private industry and it will tell people the numbers on a yearly basis, how many jobs are created in the private space sector. What is the tax revenue that the government is getting because there is private sector space activity that is going on and it will allow to set very transparent uh, goals as well as you can then form that as the basis of policy making based on real evidence rather than just uh, you know hearsay or just feelings for that matter right that is i think an extremely important and critical part of uh, all of this people talk about you know government giving grants or or other issues that uh, that need to be considered this enough money in i think uh, in a country like india where people can invest in the government you know doesn't need to really think about all of that the other important factor is opening up the government's other arms as potential anchor customers for example 
let's say you know now the china india situation is happening we know that we don't don't have enough satellites to cover the india china border on a continuous basis so now if the government says that the integrated defense staff or you know the defense space agency is allowed to procure a service from the industry directly then it opens up the ball game in a very different format so if then the you know ministry of defense says i am open to procuring a service that gives me satellite imagery or even insights of construction or any other activity at a particular resolution with a particular uh, you know uh, bands of uh, imaging and at a particular frequency of visiting a particular area you know that sets the framework for the private sector to then say i am going to compete to get that particular contract and you might have 10 companies uh, from large companies like tata to even a small company trying to compete to get that particular contract and that you know drives innovation investment and many other things it's the same with many other departments it's not just the defense department it could be even uh, ministry of agriculture you know i heard from one of your uh, previous uh, episodes pavan of uh, you know farmer talking about uh, how there is no advisory service provided to farmers on what to grow because every farmer is just uh, getting a hearsay of what the other farmers are growing and they just look at what made money the previous uh, harvest and they're growing that and there's a either an oversupply or a lack of uh, supply in which you know fluctuates the prices in the market so drastically so now why doesn't the ministry of agriculture use satellite imagery to provide an open database on what is being grown in the country and provides an advisory based on location on irrigation and soil and many other characteristics that you can as well use both space and ground based resources to tell farmers you know based on your location this is what is the advice that the government will buy, want to provide and you know the capacity for that you will need to image the entire country maybe on a daily or a weekly basis and that's where you can say that we welcome satellite imagery uh, based services to be provided uh, by the private sector as well here so narayan so there you can have um, the private sector playing a role in the upstream services and also in downstream right like for example the government can give out a certain level of advisory with a certain granularity and a certain purpose but if there are farmers who need more specific inputs if some of these systems are open enough the private sector can build on it further customize it for a farmer's needs maybe link it to market prices and other things and build products that are relevant for a farmer in rajasthan versus somebody else who's doing something in tamil nadu it's unfair for the government to want to do everything i mean my example is bhuvan right i mean i think bhuvan is a great uh, website but it's not going to replace google maps or open street maps or uh, google earth or anything else for me if isro is capable of giving those imaging services in a way where lots of other players can then use it you don't need the government to to sort of own the entire supply chain and value chain in this yeah absolutely and you know today there is a lot of uh, changes in the system where you know 10 years ago a lot of you things used to be like government to government to then citizen for example you know if uh, a fisherman uh, has to go you know get the catch and there was a service for example where uh, fishermen uh, will get this advice from based on isro satellites as to where they could go and get their catch and today for example there's a company in bombay that is uh, providing a very similar service based on european satellite data and fishermen are, are paying to access that uh, service against the free one from uh, from the guys in the fishery survey and isro because it's the interface is easier to use the advisory is in local languages it's uh, you know the, there's no confusion about using the service and essentially even though this company is using uh, foreign satellite data they've just made it so user friendly with all of the senders that is because there's an incentive for them to make that efficient because uh, you know that that's the the profit that they go get out of it right and that is the problem with all of this uh, where uh, we have to look at where private sector can create efficiency and how do you operationalize that to social good ranjana narayan thank you so much for joining me on the pragati podcast it's an absolute pleasure to have you uh, on the show and really provide more clarity at a time where we have these great new announcements but very little clarity on what's happening Thank you so much for joining me.
Thank you, Pavan. Thanks a lot, Pavan. Always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for staying with us till the end. If you have any questions or comments, do write in to podcast at thinkpragati dot com. And hey, if you like the podcast and listen to us on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, please leave us a rating and a review. It'll mean a lot to us. The Pragati Podcast is available on the IVM Podcast app and pretty much every other podcast app and platform. We are there everywhere. Hi, my name is Anupam Gupta. I'm B50 on Twitter. I am the host of Pesa Pesa, a show that talks money. On my show, I speak to experts from every field of money and finance, from stock markets, equities, debt funds, credit cards, life insurance, every possible area of money and finance that you can think of. We even did an episode on cryptocurrency. I've got fantastic guests from mutual funds to personal finance experts everywhere. Robo advisory, startups, just name it. We've got it. At Pesa Pesa, we help you make smart decisions about money. You work hard for money. Now make your money work hard for you. New episodes out every Monday, and you can listen to my show on the IVM Podcast app or any other podcasting app that you have. Hi, I'm Satyajit. Hi, I'm Racheta. We are from the Open Library Project, and we host a podcast called Paperback. Paperback is a podcast where we engage with stalwarts and experts from various industries, suggesting non-fiction titles that contributed to their journey in a big way. We've had guests like Anjali Rana, Dr. Marcus Rani, Dr. Swati Loda, Ambi Parmeswaran, Apurva Damani, and many more on our show Paperback. Find new episodes every Wednesday on IVM Podcast app, website, or wherever you listen to podcasts.